Welcome to the course of LiDAR Principles, Technologies and Sensors by Professor uh, Francesc Rocadenbosch. Francesc Rocadenbosch is with the Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya, Technical University of Catalonia, Signal Theory and Communications Department, uh, Remote Sensing Lab. This tutorial has been developed free of charge for educational purposes only and without any commercial interest. The images and figures of this tutorial have been reproduced from open sources and they are cited accordingly unless they were created by the author. If they may be infringing any copyright, please let me know to remove it in the next uh, release. Here we have a brief outline of the course. Uh, we will begin uh, in section 1 by an introduction to LiDAR. In section 2 we will progress to the optical and technological considerations for LiDAR systems. Section 3 we will tackle a LiDAR classification overview and then in sections 4 to 7 we will cover the main uh, LiDAR types uh, involved, the elastic LiDAR, the Raman LiDAR, the wind LiDAR, the dial, and we will sum up with conclusions in section uh, 8. Okay, uh, we begin with uh, the first section, the introduction. Uh, LIDAR is an acronym of uh, light uh, detection and ranging. LIDARs can be considered uh, the closest counterparts of microwave uh, radars with the exception that microwave uh, radiation has been replaced by uh, optical uh, radiation. The point one uh, you see here, uh, uh, LiDAR, I mean, we basically benefit from the strong uh, optical interaction between uh, uh, the laser and the atmospheric species of interest. In LiDAR, the sounding wavelength is often comparable to the size of the atmospheric particles, aerosols, and usually are much larger than the uh, atmospheric uh, molecules. Specifically, the interaction uh, mechanisms uh, you see here uh, are the scattering, which is due to gases and particles, and uh, absorption. The main architecture of a LiDAR system is shown in this diagram. In emission, we have the laser source, which is here, uh, emitting laser beam at one or several emission wavelengths. The emitted uh, laser radiation then uh, interacts with the atmosphere so that the return radiation or optical echo from the atmosphere uh, is collected by means of a telescope. The telescope is followed by a spectrally uh, selective uh, element we place in the focal plane or by a polychromator and after that by a set of detectors okay that convert the optical radiation at each uh, wavelength into electrical signals to be uh, recorded uh, by a computer uh, i mean the main keys uh, relative to lidar remote sensing are summarized here and are basically uh, i mean the high temporal and spatial resolutions achievable here we have spatial resolutions on the orders of meters and temporal resolutions on the order of, say, uh, seconds or, or minutes. As historical background, uh, we can say that uh, LiDAR remote sensing of the atmosphere, thanks to uh, light scattering, uh, antedates uh, the, the laser uh, invention. Uh, thus, in 1930, uh, large searchlights uh, blaze the trail to laser uh, radars or lidars. However, these conventional light sources were greatly advanced by the invention of the laser in 1960. Uh, lasers offered, uh, for instance, what you see here, I mean, uh, high uh, collimation, uh, narrow uh, spectral width, let's say less than uh, uh, 0.01 nanometers, wavelength tunability, high peak uh, energies available in very short pulses, and of course a very narrow beam uh, divergences. In 1962, uh, Fyakun Smulin first bones a laser beam of uh, the moon, which represent the birth of the LiDAR technique. In 1963, 
which is the fourth point in the slide, uh, like they use uh, code switching, which is a technology which enabled very short, uh, high uh, energy uh, pulses. In 1973, a first gallium arsenide semiconductor lighter is already uh, reported, which represents a trade off between uh, peak energy and pulse repetition frequency. To understand these, I mean, in, in this equation uh, you have here, the mean energy emitted by a pulse lighter is computed. So uh, E uh, with the bar on top uh, represents the mean uh, emitted energy. Uh, e sub P is the pulse energy. Tau sub L is the pulse width. And T is the pulse repetition period or the period uh, itself. That is the, the inverse of the pulse uh, repetition frequency. So what we have is that the mean energy is basically the product of the peak energy times this trade-off, which is uh, the pulse length uh, times uh, the pulse uh, repetition frequency. So therefore, it means that we can use lower pulse uh, energy at the expense of increasing the pulse repetition frequency. This trade-off is one of the basis of the micropulse lighter network in which a high repetition rate lasers, I mean in the kilohertz regime, are used in combination with low emission energies on the order of the microjoule uh, energy range uh, combined with uh, photon counting uh, techniques. Finally, in 2002, more or less, uh, we initiate uh, the date of the tunable laser diet technology and picosecond uh, lighter sources. So we progress now to section 2 in which we cover the main uh, optical and technological uh, considerations. So, I mean, point 1 what we have is uh, what we call the Beers or Booger's law that describes the intensity of a laser beam propagating in the atmosphere as an homogeneous uh, medium. Uh, so, the, I mean, the, 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 the ratio we have here is basically the ratio of the intensity uh, we have at the range R as compared to the intensity at the origin at range R equal to zero. This ratio is uh, defined as the transmissivity T in the range zero to R, which is basically the exponential of minus the integral of the uh, total extinction uh, along the lighter uh, sounding path, where the extinction is basically the, the sum of these three components. Uh, I mean the, the, the extinction due to scattering caused by gases, scattering caused by particles, and then absorption due to gases. Uh, this means that uh, lighters uh, must operate in spectral bands for which we have uh, atmospheric transmission uh, windows, uh, particularly the ones shown here for the visible, for the near infrared, and for the infrared. Uh, this raises the issue also of a safety. For instance, in Europe, the maximum uh, permitted exposure is computed according to this standard, the EN60 AU5. Uh, laser safety uh, standard. Uh, beyond 1.4 microns, uh, there begins an A safe region so that this threshold is increased to power densities of, say, uh, 100 milliwatts per square uh, centimeter and energy densities of around one, 1 joule per square centimeter. However, for wavelengths greater than 1.5 uh, microns, there are less laser sources available. 1.55 microns being a widely used practical a safe uh, wetland. So this raises the issue uh, we have uh, in the last point, I, I mean, which is that we have a trade off between uh, laser sources and uh, detector availability in the market. Okay, uh, in this slide, we tackle. Um, the basic uh, elastic uh, scattering uh, mechanisms. Concerning uh, optical atmospheric scattering, there are two uh, elastic scattering mechanisms. First is what you have in this uh, 
gray rectangle is uh, the Raleigh uh, scattering, which is due to atmospheric molecules for which, uh, I say, the size or the uh, model radii is much lower than the laser sounding wavelength. The second type of elastic scattering is the Mi scattering, which is due to atmospheric uh, aerosols and for which uh, the radii uh, is comparable to the sounding wavelength. The Raleigh the scattering diagram is shown uh, uh, below on, 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 the, on, the, on the left side of, of the slide. And I mean, the Raleigh the scattering diagram is always H shaped. I mean, in this polar diagram, which is also called uh, the phase function, the propagation direction is uh, theta uh, equal to zero. The Raleigh backscattering coefficient you have here on the right uh, is given by the expression uh, you have here uh, listed, but the important part is that it always follows a lambda to the minus four spectral uh, uh, dependency. Uh, where, I mean, in this equation, n is the molecule number density, n is the complex refraction index, lambda is, of course, the wavelength, and delta n is the, the polarization uh, uh, ratio. Okay, we have a look to the, to the Mi scattering diagram, again, on the bottom left part. I mean, we see that the Mi uh, diagram is more complex, with plenty of uh, secondary lobes, and with a strong dependency on the imaginary part of the refraction index, for which I mean the imaginary part of the refraction index uh, models the, the absorption. Uh, an interesting distinguishing uh, feature concerning me scattering is that the spectral uh, dependency uh, follows a lambda to the minus kappa um, law. Uh, I mean kappa being called the Armstrong coefficient uh, usually, uh, I mean, typical values could be uh, kappa equal to 1, I mean, lambda to the minus 1, uh, though the ranges could be, let's say, from 0 to 2. Uh, okay, now we go to section 3, in which we, we give a, a, a brief uh, overview on the different uh, types of LiDAR uh, systems. If we come up to a classification based on their application, we have uh, basically three types. The elastic backscatter LiDAR, simply called uh, the backscatter LiDAR, which measures the average content of uh, particular molecular matter in the atmosphere, but up to a point it can also measure winds using um, cross-correlation uh, techniques. Uh, the second uh, type is the, the wind LiDAR, which is also called uh, Doppler LiDAR. The third type uh, is the family of spectroscopic LiDAR, which in turn can cover the Raman and the dial, and that it is aimed at the measurement of uh, chemical uh, species. I mean, based on the, on, on the configuration, we have the monostatic and the biostatic LiDAR. The monostatic uh, LiDAR, uh, I, I mean, the emission laser and the receiving uh, telescope are uh, collocated. Hmm? So these cover all the types, the backscatter, the dial, the Raman, etc. The biostatic LiDAR, the laser and the telescope are uh, set apart. And of course, we also have the possibilities of having the, the, the LiDAR, uh, airborne, uh, helicopters, planes, satellites uh, on board uh, bands and trucks and uh, ground-based. Sorry. Well, this table here shows a comparison among different uh, LiDAR types, uh, laser sources used, and possible um, measurements for, 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 for those LiDARs. The first LiDAR type corresponds to the elastic LiDAR, and here we have three subtypes. The first subtype, which is uh, what I point out here, is the simplest LiDAR of all, the backscatter uh, LiDAR. Okay, which uh, we will cover in more detail in section four. The section, uh, sorry, the, the backscatter uh, LiDAR is aimed at uh, measuring the backscatter intensity from airborne atmospheric aerosols and molecules. Direct measurements are, uh, for instance, measurement of uh, dust intrusion load, 
clothes and smoke. And as indirect measurements, uh, you see here, we can infer, let's say, the aerosol transport and acidification. The second and third, and third uh, subtypes of elastic gliders here correspond to the Doppler wind glider, which uh, we will tackle in section uh, 6. Okay, uh, the second main type okay, we have here is the Raman glider. The Raman glider is aimed at quantitative uh, retrieval of aerosol uh, concentrations and measurement of the concentration of chemical species in the atmosphere provided they are present in abundant uh, concentrations. Uh, the differential absorption LiDAR is a spectroscopic LiDAR by excellence, uh, I mean requiring a, a tunable laser source such as the ones uh, you have here, the Xamer uh, laser, the Titanium Sapphire or the OPPO which is the optoparametric uh, oscillator. Finally, the fluorescence lighter is less common and it is specifically focused on the detection of the atmospheric species uh, listed here. Now let's talk a little bit uh, on, on detectors. In this slide uh, we plot the spectral detectivity for detectors of interest in lighters which uh, is usually in the 0.2 to 10 microns uh, range. I mean, in the plot you have on the right, I mean, in ordinates, you have the detectivity and in abscesses the wavelength uh, in microns. The detectivity is defined here uh, on the right as the inverse of the noise equivalent power, uh, I mean the NEP, um, corrected by the, by the square root of the of the product uh, area bandwidth of the uh, detector. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the higher the detectivity, the better the detector. The cubes uh, in black, I mean, we have on, on, on the right, correspond to the detectivity. I, I mean, uh, it's in fact the, the, the spectral response uh, associated to the different uh, detectors. Photoconductors are labeled PC and photodiodes are labeled uh, PD. The horizontal bars I've uh, plotted here uh, represent the operational range of different uh, semiconductor materials and, and detector technologies uh, used. Hmm? For example, if, if we have a look to, to this uh, blue line, uh, I mean uh, between uh, 200 and 700 nanometers, I mean PMTs, which are uh, photomultiplier tubes, are the most efficient and they are almost used exclusively here, particularly for the detection of very uh, low light levels. Infrared uh, wa wavelengths, I mean, let's say above uh, 800 uh, nanometers, the materials used in the photocathode seems to be effective and solid state detectors are used in instead. I mean, uh, one example is the near infrared uh, detector based on the silicon APD you have here in this red bar uh, which is typical for the neodymium uh, YAC uh, laser source wavelength of, of uh, 1064 uh, nanometers. Okay, so now we, we, we start with, with uh, the main big section uh, devoted to the elastic backscatter lighter. Well, the, the operational principle is that uh, we have the same uh, emission and reception uh, wavelength, I mean the laser emits at lambda zero and the atmosphere answers at uh, lambda zero, so there is no shift uh, in reception. It uses uh, me and Raleigh to scattering to interrate the intervening uh, atmosphere and the environmental applications we have is, I mean, uh, what you see here, I mean pollution monitoring, aerosol uh, monitoring, I mean aerosols uh, are particles from human and anthropogenic origin and aerosol monitoring is interesting uh, in order to uh, let's say law enforcement concerning air quality regulations, uh, fire detections and so on. Also in transport models where we want to forecast the movement of pollutants uh, to the critical receiver and also in say studies which is cloud height and extent or rain detection. What we see here is the first uh, backscatter lighter station in Spain 
uh, built in, in, my, in my lab, I mean in the, in the remote sensing lab in 1996, and located uh, well in the north campus of the uh, Polytech, uh, of the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya in, in Barcelona. By the time, uh, I mean, we use a neodymium yak uh, solid state laser, I mean you have all the specs here, of putting uh, pulses of uh, 1 joule energy at 1064 and half a joule energy at 532 nanometers with a pulse repetition frequency of 10 Hz. The raw data special resolution of the LiDAR was uh, 7.5 meters and with a maximum vertical sounding range of around 50 meters under clear air collisions, I mean, and signal to noise ratio equal to unity as the definition of the maximum uh, range. Okay, uh, well, now let's, let's have a look to, uh, in more detail to the interaction of a, of a laser pulse with the atmosphere. To understand this slide, uh, imagine that the atmosphere is the depleted of everything with uh, just a single layer uh, containing the scatterers. I mean, the single layer containing the scatterers is here. The lighter emits a pulse of light of duration tau that travels to the atmosphere. Okay, so if we if we see uh, this animation, okay, as long as the travel pulses to the atmosphere, we see that okay here part of the pulse is, is a scattered back to the laser source and part of the pulse is transmitted forward okay and scattered back again until uh, okay until now I mean until the trailing uh, edge of the pulse reaches the end of the uh, scattering layer from this uh, animation we see that the spatial resolution okay that is uh, written here delta R would directly be Okay, what, what you have here, uh, the, the special resolution would be uh, R0, okay, we have here, minus R1, that is C tau divided by 2, R0 minus R1. So this factor 2 is due to the two-way traveling path of, of the pulse, I mean, go and return to the atmosphere. If, on the other hand, uh, we use a finite bandwidth detection uh, system, I mean, with a detection time uh, tau sub d, okay, which is, for instance, the inverse of the sampling rate, whatever, I mean, the spatial resolution uh, becomes, okay, c tau sub l divided by 2 plus c tau detection divided by uh, by 2. Mm -hmm. uh, if tau d is much uh, longer than the pulse width, this reduces to this uh, approximation. Okay, now we tackle the derivation of the elastic glider equation under the assumption of single scattering. Okay, what we have here is the, the telescope and the laser. Okay, so the, the laser, imagine that it emits with a full divergence uh, angle to, uh, to delta theta, which is what is uh, uh, wrote here. Okay, this, this cylinder here uh, represents the uh, observation volume in the atmosphere. Its length is delta r, which is the spatial resolution due to the, lies, to the laser pool, so c tau sub l divided by 2, and uh, its radius, okay, uh, lowercase r, is the range, uh, capital R, times the half angle laser divergence, uh, delta theta. So this cylinder is, is full of, of scatters, I mean aerosols and molecules that uh, scatter the, the laser light in all uh, directions. So that's what is symbolized uh, here. But what happens, uh, what happens is that only part of the uh, scattered radiation in all directions is seen by the LiDAR telescope. The backscatter radiation seen by the telescope is one uh, is, is the one within this this uh, solid angle uh, delta omega, which is the area of the telescope divided by r square. This is a solid angle from which the telescope uh, aperture here is seen from a scatter from a scatterer inside the, the, the inside the scattering uh, volume. Okay. So now uh, we can derive the elastic backscatter LiDAR equation step by step. Uh, so uh, in point one we have the laser power uh, 
per pulse, so it's simply energy divided by pulse length. Uh, in point two, what we have is the incident power density on the atmospheric uh, resolution volume or resolution cell, so it's simply P divided by PR squared, I mean the, the area of the base of the cylinder, times this term which represents the, the go path transmittance, that's the toll we pay uh, for traveling uh, through the scattering volume a distance r. Uh, in point three we have the cell path scattered power per solid angle unit, so that's basically the incident power uh, density on the atmospheric resolution uh, cell times beta, which can be understood for the time being as a, as a reflection coefficient, times the scattering volume, which is used here to match the unit. So that's the scattering volume of the cylinder, PR squared times delta R. So the pack scatter power collected by the telescope is simply the cell pack scattered power multiplied by the solid angle uh, by which the scatterers in the volume see the telescope aperture time the uh, times the, the transmittance the atmospheric transmittance from the scattering volume back to the to the light okay so if we substitute one equation in the other okay we finally get uh, this expression okay which is the lighter equation that here we we come in, uh, in more uh, detail okay so uh, in this equation, uh, alpha is the uh, total atmospheric optical extinction coefficient, I mean uh, extinction due to uh, aerosols and molecules, uh, beta is the uh, atmospheric optical backscatter uh, coefficient, I mean the, but, uh, beta can be understood as a backscattering cross-section uh, per unit uh, volume and solid angle unit, I mean square meters of cross-section per unit volume and which is cubic meters and solid angle unit or equivalently uh, the mean number concentration of the aerosol and molecular atmospheric mixture which is what you have here as, uh, as n uh, times uh, the mean uh, backscattering uh, cross-section okay of this of the of the scatters or of the mean uh, scatter okay uh, p is the optical return power k is the system constant okay and uh, she is the overlap uh, factor uh, to be explained uh, next so here we have the the explanation of this correction term she of r which is the the overlap factor the overlap factor can be understood as, I mean, the crossover function between the, the laser uh, the laser divergence, okay, and the telescope uh, field of view, so that, I mean, not all the illuminated atmospheric cross-section, okay, is seen within the field of view of the telescope. In that case, only this part of the atmospheric cross-section is seen within the telescope field of view. The telescope, uh, the, the, the overlap factor is normalized uh, to unity, so it goes always from zero to, to unity. I mean, zero is no overlap and unity is full overlap. Okay, uh, in fact the overlap factor as you see here it is a function of many geometrical and optical parameters involving both the laser and the telescope. This plot on the, on the right from, from this reference below from measures, uh, we plot the overlap factor as a function of the normalized uh, range for uh, a given normalized laser to telescope uh, separation distance, which is d, uh, a given uh, laser uh, divergence, which is uh, theta, uh, normalized uh, telescope to laser aperture, a, and uh, of course uh, for different uh, mm, for different uh, field of views of the telescope, uh, which is uh, which is uh, fixed. Okay, in this in this slide we revisit a little bit the optoelectronic, uh, sorry, the optoatmospheric coefficients. Uh, I mean, for the for the purpose of of lidar system design and and link budget assessment. 
as I already said, uh, I mean, backscatter lighters operate in transmission windows, so this means that the extinction alpha uh, due to absorption can be, can be uh, neglected in elastic backscatter uh, lighter. Therefore, the, the total extinction coefficient is simply the sum of the aerosol extinction coefficient plus the molecular extinction uh, coefficient. The backscatter coefficient is always, by definition, the sum of the aerosol backscatter coefficient and uh, the molecular backscatter coefficient. On the right, I mean, the plot on the right, we have uh, approximate values for the extinction and uh, backscatter coefficients, I mean, those values uh, here. Uh, as a function of, of the wavelength you have uh, in abscesses and for different atmospheric uh, conditions. I mean clear air, thick haze, light water cloud, uh, etc. Uh, well, just as, as, a, as a few more comments on the ladder uh, equation, we can say that, I mean, assuming a homogeneous atmosphere and an ideality system con uh, conditions, uh, the LIDAR equations take uh, the, the, the simplest form, which is uh, written here in range corrected form. I mean, we multiply the LIDAR equation by R squared. If we do that, what we see is the range corrected power is proportional to the backscatter transmittance product. The optical depth or optical thickness in the path, in the sounding path, I mean from 0 to R, is defined as the, uh, as the integral from 0 to R of the total extinction. Okay, and uh, this optical depth can be related to the two-way path transmittance, uh, as you see here. Okay, in this section uh, 5.2, we, we carry out uh, very basic inversions. The, the, the first or the simplest way to invert is uh, by simply doing the range correction. Uh, as I mentioned, you retrieve the, the backscatter transmitting uh, plot, which under clear air conditions is directly proportional to the backscatter, so it is directly proportional to the mean aerosol molecule concentration uh, aloft. So this uh, is enough to reveal the atmospheric structure in terms of uh, mixing aerosol layers and cloud structure, as, as you see here. Okay, so uh, I mean, in blue I've represented a, a, a purely relate uh, atmosphere. Uh, okay, here you have uh, the, 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 in, uh, the increase of the overlap factor, okay, so uh, close to here you will have the apparent overlap factor close to, to unity, okay, here you have an inhomogeneity due to aerosols, okay, and here you have two well-defined uh, cloud layers. Uh, Another interesting point concerning basic inversions is the salometry. Uh, on, on the bottom right plot, uh, you have a salometric plot uh, in which uh, we uh, depict the cloud base uh, represented uh, uh, by uh, crosses, uh, the cloud peak uh, represented by uh, asterisk, and the apparent cloud top. I mean, assuming that the, the, the light uh, can go out of the cloud and it is not distinguished uh, in between. Uh, this is represented by 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 the circles. Okay, so this is a, a synthetic uh, plot with uh, all this information using uh, range corrected uh, information. Okay, uh, in this slide, uh, I mean, here we see an example of an elastic LiDAR inversion at 532 uh, by using the two-component uh, elastic LiDAR inversion algorithm, or the so-called uh, kletfernal sassano I mean, it's, it's not at KFS in the slides, okay? So the kletfernal sassano algorithm is constrained here with uh, some photometer measure optical thickness in order to invert. Uh, the profile of the extinction uh, coefficient. So, okay, the, the four panels uh, you have here uh, at the top, 
represent from left to right, I mean here the, the, the range corrected LiDAR signal at 532, the inverted uh, aerosol backscatter coefficient prof uh, profile, so the beta as a function of height, uh, here the inverted aerosol extinction, so uh, alpha as a function of height, and uh, in the last one the inverted LiDAR ratio. The LiDAR ratio is defined as the ratio of the aerosol extinction to the, um, to the aerosol backscatter. The elastic inverted uh, optical uh, parameters are plotted in blue, okay, so extinction in blue, backscatter in blue, along with uh, error bars in uh, magenta, okay. For comparison, uh, I mean, I have also plotted uh, the, the, the Raman uh, uh, inversion, I mean, alpha and beta retrieved from, from Raman inversion using, uh, uh, okay, in, in cyan uh, color, okay. The two plot colors uh, at the bottom uh, represent the 96 hours high split back trajectories, and here on the right, the dose, the dust load map using the, the dream, the dream model. Okay, and, and what you see here is simply, uh, I, I mean, an example of the graphic user interface for elastic glider inversion, uh, the one we have here, the remote sensing lab. So for instance, in the top plot, we have range corrected power at 532 from zero to 20 kilometers. The plot in the middle, in the middle uh, you have the backscatter coefficient along with error bars and the, and I mean in the, in the bottom plot you have the, the extinction coefficient inverted, okay, and of course with plenty of configuration uh, parameters. Okay, so in section uh, 4.3 uh, we, we talk a little bit on the, on the LiDAR receiver uh, architecture for an analog LiDAR receiving channel at 1064 nanometers, uh, as example. I mean, the, the main aim of the optoelectronic chain is to convert the receive uh, signal comprising the LiDAR return uh, P of R and the background uh, component, uh, I mean, due to a stray light from the moon, the sun, etc., P back, into a voltage uh, B of R at the output of the chain, I mean at the output of the ADC, which is the analog to digital converter. In this diagram, L is an attenuator uh, modeling the receiving optics uh, losses. Uh, R sub I in amperes per watt represents the photodiode current responsivity, and GT is the transimpedance uh, amplifier, which is usually followed by a voltage to voltage uh, conversion, uh, I mean, uh, conditioning uh, stage, uh, which is shown here and implemented uh, by means of a two stage uh, amplifier, GAC1, GAC2. The analog to digital conversion is represented by the ADC block here. It is also important to outline that uh, there are three main noise uh, sources uh, depicted. Uh, this uh, NSH, S is uh, the photo-induced shot noise due to the uh, poison statistics of the light intensity uh, in reception, so we signal induced uh, shot noise. Uh, this one here uh, is the dark shot noise associated to the dark current of the photodetector, and NTH here and here, okay, is uh, thermal noise, uh, okay, at different stages of the, of the receiving change. Well, on the old, uh, this gives rise to the signal-to-noise ratio defined as the useful voltage divided by the noise uh, voltage. Okay, uh, details about the computation of the different uh, sources can be found in detail from the paper cited below. Now, in this section uh, 4.5, uh, we have some examples of uh, LiDAR networks uh, around the world. For example, uh, I mean the MPL net uh, shown in 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 brown by in brown uh, circles is the, the NASA uh, Micropulse uh, LiDAR network, and it is the only tropospheric uh, profiling uh, network with uh, global uh, coverage. 
uh, realm is a regional east uh, aerosol layer uh, masonet in the in the US uh, and the ACC in in, in white uh, dots here uh, I mean is is the network for the detection of aerosol composition change and it is aimed at, at uh, stratospheric and upper uh, troposphere uh, monitoring. Okay, it is also important to line uh, the early net, which is the European aerosol research uh, lidar network we have uh, in, in Europe. Uh, you can see the detail here on the right, which is aimed at vertical profiling of, of aerosols at uh, continental uh, scale. Well, and in this slide, uh, you see different possibilities of sensing the atmosphere by means of LiDAR. I mean, from ground-based uh, seilometers, which are, you know, the simple low-cost bus cutter LiDARs, to airborne uh, LiDARs, which can sense the atmosphere outwards or uh, downwards, or to uh, space-borne uh, LiDARs, such as uh, light. I mean, the space fields and onboard LiDAR sensor was used in the 1994 Discovery Shuttle to demonstrate the possibility to measure cloud structure and aerosols um, global uh, scale. Another example you see here, you also can read the, the specs, is, is Calypso, which is a joint NASA uh, CNES uh, environmental satellite. Um, from 2006. I mean, Calypso stands for Cloud Aerosol LiDAR and Infrared uh, Pathfinder Satellite Observation and is part of the afternoon train, the, the A-train uh, constellation. Calypso is equipped with uh, with Calliop, I mean with, with an elastic LiDAR sensor which is called uh, Calliop. Here you have uh, all the specs I mean, Calliope stands for Cloud Aerosol LiDAR with orthogonal uh, polarization and it measures the backscatter at 532 and 1064 nanometers wavelength along with uh, the polarization ratio. Okay, uh, just as an example, the early net uh, stations uh, in Europe provide uh, ground truth uh, calibration validation information and carry out coordinated uh, measurements with Calypso over paces. I mean, um, with, uh, okay, with, with this measurement strategy you see here. Uh, just as an example for case one, uh, which is uh, what you see now, I mean, each area at the station, uh, okay, is one validation point for Calypso and performs measurements as close as possible in time and space to the Calypso overflight. I mean, other measurement uh, protocols apply for cases two and three, okay, depending on the temporal and spatial proximity of the LiDAR stations to the Calypso uh, overpasses. Okay, so we, we start now uh, with section five, uh, which covers in more detail the, the Raman LiDAR. I mean, in Raman LiDAR, we have the case of inelastic uh, interaction with the atmospheric uh, scatters. This means that, I mean, in contrast to elastic LiDAR, in which the emission reception wavelengths uh, coincided. I mean, here in Raman LiDAR, the return wavelength uh, becomes shifted from the emission one and it is always longer than the emission wavelength. That means that the Raman interaction with the atmospheric scatters involves uh, a loss of, of energy. This is okay. what I've tried to depict uh, here. The most uh, common uh, direct measurement, okay, uh, I've summarized here, is the concentration of chemical, uh, is the measurement of the concentration of uh, chemical species in the atmosphere, such as the ones uh, listed here. However, uh, indirect measurements uh, are also possible, such as the independent inversion of the optical atmospheric extinction and backscatter parameters, I mean alpha and beta, as, as the ones I shown in the, in the case example uh, before in section 4. Okay, this is possible when combining uh, an elastic channel with a Raman channel. 
and as an indirect measurements we can also carry out temperature and uh, humidity measurements okay well here you have a summary of the main uh, characteristics I mean in point one is what we have said in the previous slide and in point two what we see is that the wavelength shift uh, appears for each uh, atmospheric or, or chemical species on the table on, on, on the left as part of let's say its a spectral signature uh, so uh, I mean the, the cross sections uh, you read uh, here are normalized to that of the nitrogen because uh, I mean we use nitrogen as normalizing species because it is the most uh, abundant atmospheric gas with 78 percent in, in volume Okay, I mean the the plot, uh, sorry, the the toll you 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 pay to do that is is point three here. I mean very faint returns. I, I mean the Raman cross section is about three to four orders of magnitude lower than the elastic one. This requires uh, photon counting and very often uh, night uh, time uh, operation. Well, uh, as mentioned, uh, the main applications of Raman systems is the obtention of calibrated products such as the uh, absolute concentration of chemical species or the quantitative retrieval of the aerosol extinction and backscatter when combined with an elastic channel or as a temperature profile. However, the important point to notice is uh, um, that uh, in the spectroscopic sensing uh, we suffer from low sensitivity because of the low Raman cross-section. This limits the detection to a species present in the atmosphere to high concentrations. So for instance, uh, um, I mean, we, we use Raman spectroscopic sensing for monitoring abundant species such as those coming out uh, from chimney uh, stacks. Okay? In contrast, Raman measurements are always uh, range resolved and there is no need to tune the laser in absorption bands, which is a key advantage for, for the Raman technique. Okay, in this slide you have the Raman spectrum characteristics. So, I mean, imagine you emit in the green at, at 532 uh, here. So in response to elastic scattering, I mean uh, Raleigh and Mie scattering from aerosols and molecules, um, I mean in response to, to this elastic scattering where there is no wavelength shift and you get backscattered radiation at the same emission wavelength, that is uh, 532, okay. Uh, Concerning Raman scattering uh, from the different atmospheric species, I, I mean uh, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, water vapor, I mean we have uh, Raman shifts at, at uh, 607, nitrogen at uh, uh, 580 nanometers and 660 nanometers due to the water vapor. These lines, which are ended with dots, are called the main vibrational lines or Q branch Raman lines. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, in addition to those uh, stronger uh, Raman um, vibrational lines, there are side lobes here, 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 and here. Okay, uh, that convey temperature information, and that they are called uh, rotational uh, Raman lines. Well, I mean, in section 5.4, uh, we tackle a little bit the, the uh, how uh, molecular uh, gas detection is possible using uh, Raman LiDAR. So, the principles of molecular species gas detection. The idea is uh, that the absolute concentration of a given molecular species, call it X, can be performed by comparing the Raman backscatter uh, intensity of this species with that of the Raman line from nitrogen which occupies the, the same uh, volume. So, uh, I mean, in equation uh, 1 here, okay, 1 meets at, at, at lambda 0, okay, and the Raman backscattered signal from the gas, I mean, uh, Raman backscattered signal in the return path of the atmosphere is, sorry, is at uh, lambda x. In equation 2 here, 
one computes the ratio between the, the Raman return at, at, at the lambda x, so this is equation 1, and the Raman return at the lambda n, which corresponds to the, to the atmospheric nitrogen and which is the reference uh, channel. I mean, in an oversimplified uh, approach, the molecule number concentration we want to retrieve, which is n of the gas, I mean uh, n sub x, I mean, can be obtained from the nitrogen molecule number concentration, okay, which is n sub n, uh, in blue in the denominator, uh, and the uh, normalized uh, cross-section and the ratio of powers p lambda x divided by p uh, lambda n. Okay, in section 6 we, uh, we start uh, the modulus uh, about uh, wind lidar. So there are uh, basically three key measurement uh, techniques. Uh, coherent Doppler LiDAR, okay, which is uh, the most uh, important one. Uh, you can have uh, measurements, uh, range resolve, focus, uh, and using a vertical azimuth display scanning. Second type uh, would be the direct detection Doppler uh, LiDAR, which involves direct detection of the Doppler return uh, frequency. This is also called sometimes incoherent Doppler LiDAR. And uh, the third type copper covers uh, spatial correlation techniques using an elastic LiDAR and which is uh, less reliable as compared to the other uh, types. Okay? On the right you have the most common laser types and, and, and typical uh, specs. Okay, just as an introduction, uh, I mean the idea is that with uh, wind lidar, I mean we use airborne particles and molecules as tracers. Right? Uh, along with the Doppler principle to invert the wind radial uh, component. An important remark here is that the Doppler wind uh, LiDAR measures the wind component along the line of sight uh, direction. This is uh, what we see in this uh, drawing. Okay, This is uh, what we call the wind radial uh, component. Okay, the, the Doppler shift, which is uh, F uh, sub D uh, in the return radiation, can be related to the radial uh, velocity V sub R, or, I mean, can be related to the radial velocity of the scatterers uh, V sub R using this formula uh, here. So that, I mean, positive speeds, uh, I mean, uh, aerosols moving further from the LiDAR give negative Doppler shifts. I mean, all the space agencies such as NASA or, or ESA have wind satellite missions such as LOS or ADM AELUS, I mean, the atmospheric uh, dynamic mission aerials to, uh, I mean, let's say for global wind profile uh, observation. Well, this slide uh, we present the most uh, important measurement technique, which is uh, what we call range resolve uh, Doppler LiDAR. Um, here you have, let's say, uh, the the mission reception. I mean, at the, at the bottom you have the mission reception block diagram for a heterodyne uh, coherent Doppler LiDAR. I mean, uh, and in a mission, what you have is uh, a local uh, oscillator, the laser, uh, which acts as the local oscillator at F0, and it is usually a low-power uh, CIDR uh, laser, okay? The modulator, which is uh, called here MOD, is a Q-switch unit that uh, ensures appropriate pulse duration and the spectral purity of the laser pulse, okay? So that goes to the atmosphere at frequency F0, and in reception from the atmosphere we get F0 plus minus FD, uh, I mean the Doppler frequency we want to, to separate hmm, or to detect. Uh, to do that what we do is that we, we, we mix uh, the, 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 the optical uh, return uh, we meet the, the backscattered uh, return uh, pulses 
with a reference uh, laser beam, okay, uh, which we have here, but at frequency f0 minus f delta, that, that, that is, uh, I mean, shifted uh, f uh, delta with respect to the local oscillator frequency. This is called a pterodyne uh, reception. Okay, so if we look with uh, a spectrum analyzer at the intermediate frequency output, okay, of the mixer uh, here, we would have uh, positive or negative Doppler shifts around F delta, uh, which is the advantage in front of a uh, homodyne uh, receiver scheme. Uh, finally, uh, we identify, uh, let's say, modulus phase of the Doppler shift or equivalently in phase and quadrature uh, components by means of uh, this uh, quad detector, I mean, the, the, the quadrature uh, detector, okay? Okay, in, in, in the top right uh, figure, uh, I mean, we, we have another point to comment on, which is the characteristics of the return Doppler uh, spectrum. I mean, aerosols uh, swept away by the wind and which serve, as, as we have said, as wind tracers, contribute uh, a narrow uh, peak, which is the peak of interest to, to be detected, I mean, from which the, the Doppler shift is detected. However, a large molecular motion inside the, the, the scattering volume uh, causes molecular Doppler broadening and widens the base of the spectrum, so this is like a, a kind of background noise, okay? Okay, one well-known algorithm to retrieve the uh, three components of the wind speed is uh, the VAV algorithm. Uh, VAV stands for Vertical Azimut uh, Display. To see how it works, uh, okay, uh, please have a look at, at the figure we have on, on the left, I mean, to the coordinate system. Uh, we have the LiDAR in point O, so here we have the LiDAR, and the, the LiDAR line of sight is depicted here by, by vector R, okay, describes a conical scan. The wind velocity is represented by uh, this uh, vector S with wind components uh, UVW. In this configuration, the radial, uh, the radial wind speed measured by the LiDAR is, uh, okay, is the projection of the wind speed uh, vector on the direction uh, R. Okay, so it's the projection of this onto uh, vector R. If we represent the uh, evolution of the radial wind speed component as a function of the uh, azimuth scant angle phi, okay, so if we represent this function, okay, as a function of uh, of phi, okay, what we see is that the, is that from the amplitude and offset of this semi-dial variation, the three wind components can be uh, retrieved. Okay, this figure we see uh, as a final um, uh, example on uh, a Doppler LiDAR measurement at El Dorado Canyon from the, piper, uh, from the paper seated uh, below. The LiDAR is at the center of the polar diagram, which is a plant position indicator. Uh, positive speeds, I mean from white to red in the color bar, are outwards uh, from the LiDAR, and negative speeds Speeds uh, from white to purple are inwards to the LiDAR. In the top left uh, panel, the, the green uh, area here indicates wind at uh, minus 4 meters per second coming from the northwest direction to the LiDAR and going uh, southeast. Uh, this is the, the red uh, area at some uh, 14 meters per second. The second panel here, it is the top right, we uh, start to have wind coming from the uh, north-east uh, uh, direction, so that uh, northwest and northeast wind is pushed forward to the south uh, southeast. In the third uh, panel, okay, um, there is a little wind inflow from the from the left. I mean, from the west uh, northwest 
with the inflow uh, from the right, I mean from the east. The wind current goes outwards to the north, uh, well, to the north, uh, northwest direction, and to the south, okay? Let's say south, uh, southwest. Hmm? So, I mean, the, the change in the wind flow direction is self explanatory from the arrows and colors in, in third and fourth uh, panels. Okay, in this section of uh, uh, 6.3, we give a brief outlook to the direct detection uh, Doppler LiDAR. Um, I mean, uh, those uh, Doppler frequency detection techniques are no longer based on the traditional uh, heterodyne or homodyne uh, receiver. Uh, for instance, the, the edge uh, technique uh, uses a Fabry Perot uh, or etalon used as a, as a filter, as a, as a frequency to amplitude uh, transduce, transducer. So this is equivalent to frequency and the transmission of the filter becomes uh, the frequency uh, mm, tra transducer uh, tool. So that, I mean, the Doppler frequency is estimated by the, by the, the change in, in, in transmission we have here. Okay, the double edge techniques. Uh, the principle is similar, but we use two etalons symmetrically located around the reference uh, laser line. Okay, but more details can be found in this uh, source uh, below because I mean we need intercalibrations usually from from pulse to pulse and, and a tuning control on the on the fabric bar. Okay, in section seven we cover the the dial which is the next big category i would like to to comment uh, i mean uh, dial uh, stands uh, for differential absorption lidar and it is a spectroscopic lidar aimed at gas detection uh, for excellence okay uh, the dial uses two or more tuning uh, wavelengths, usually two, lambda and lambda prime, one which is tuned to be absorbed by the atmospheric species of interest and the other mm, to be not absorbed. Okay? If the full sounding path of, of, the, of the dial is occupied with gas, uh, the mean column contained concentration uh, and sub a can be retrieved from this equation, which basically means computing the log ratio of the return powers of the absorbing and non-absorbing uh, mm, wavelengths and using the uh, differential absorption cross-section, which is simply uh, sigma A prime minus sigma A available from tabulated values, uh, I mean, for instance, hydrant. In this figure on the right, uh, we see one of the first spectroscopic uh, measurements reported by Roth in, in 1974, in which we have carbon dioxide contour concentrations around an industrial area. Contour lines here separated by half a part per million uh, steps. Okay, an important, an important distinctive feature with respect to, to the Raman spectroscopic LiDAR is that the laser wavelength must be tuned, must be tuned to the specific absorption band of each uh, gas of interest. So the applications you have, I mean, concentration of chemical species in the atmosphere, car exhaust, refineries, here you have a typical list of, of gases, but also temperature and, and humidity are pos uh, can be measured indirectly. On the right, we have uh, a range resolve uh, measurement of a major environmental gas, which is the water vapor, from ground level to 8 kilometers in height uh, during 12 hours. The quantity represented is the water mm, vapor mixing ratio, which is, I mean, grams of water per kilogram of uh, dry air. And okay, in this slide we have, um, I mean, in, in this figure, on the top figure on the left, we have uh, an example in which uh, you have the, the absorption cross-section uh, as a function of wavelength for three gases. This is experimental data. Those three gases are toluene, benzene, and peroxylene. And how the, the lambda on and lambda off are selected. I mean, lambda on and lambda off are lambda and lambda prime in the previous uh, slide. Okay, 
So lambda on uh, is the laser emission wavelength that is specifically tuned to fall on the peak on the absorption uh, uh, the peak of the absorption line of the toluene at Q66.9 nanometers. A lambda off uh, okay is tuned at Q66.1 nanometers and falls uh, off the wing of the toluene absorption. Okay, here you have all the, all the data. Finally, there are many other laser radar systems, uh, usually called uh, LADAR. Hmm? One interesting uh, example is the 3D uh, LADAR imaging, in which a high repetition laser uh, emits uh, millions of laser pulses, sometimes following a random spatial distribution, uh, sometimes following a predefined scan pattern, in order to scan the solid target of interest. An example of LADAR imaging is the scanned facade of this building uh, you have on the top left or this magnificent image of downtown Florence acquired using an helicopter LADAR. Distance information is retrieved uh, as always from the time of flight uh, delay. Well, as concluding uh, remarks, one must say that there is not an old terrain, an old problem, <laughs> lighter uh, uh, system solution. Uh, thus, uh, I mean, backscatter lighters, uh, we have seen that they offer a relatively simple, uh, cost effective solution for both environmental and meteorological modeling. Raman layer and dial solutions for spectroscopic probing can be understood as, as chemical radars, which is a technological breakthrough. Point three, what we see is that when wavelength backscattered LIDAR channels are combined with cooperative Raman LIDAR channels and alternative remote sensing instrumentation, such as microwave radars, in situ sensors, probing zones, and satellites, it is possible to, to come up with high quantitative, uh, high quality, uh, quantitative environmental data and to build up uh, observational networks at medium and large continental scales. Wind LiDAR sensing uh, is complex, uh, that's what we have in point four. The design must be optimized for a particular set of conditions to be cost uh, effective. However, all in all, I think we have well demonstrated the capabilities of the LiDAR techniques and the actual trends uh, are towards AF safety, scalability, and managed and attended operation, faster scanning capabilities, and uh, networking. This contains about 21 years of LiDAR remote sensing at the remote sensing lab of the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, UPC. Thank you very much for your attention.